Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Well, uh, Brad, welcome to, to Econ 102. Uh, we're, we're, we're stoked to have you on. So excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So as a, as a brief introduction to you, you're, of course, the founder of General Assembly of, of Common and now of, uh, of Thesis Driven, uh, which is a... Um, why don't I have you uh, introduce it to uh, No Opinion readers and Econ 102 listeners? Yeah, so we're really tackling themes in the built world in, in, in real estate from kind of a top-down level of what's happening, why is it happening, looking at a macro, macroeconomic trends and factors, things like interest rates, but also cultural changes and technology and the role those things are playing in what we're seeing today happen in the real estate world. So we do get a little wonky sometimes in terms of uh, introducing introducing some topics. Sometimes it might go a little bit past 102 uh, because we have a lot of developers, we have a lot of investors who, uh, who subscribe and listen in on Thesis Driven, but we try to make it fun too and tackle like new and exciting topics. So uh, we're just talking about a uh, podcast we just released with uh, Jan Schrammack who is the founder and CEO of California Forever, actually building a new city uh, in Solano County, California, about 60 miles northeast of San Francisco. And of course, to a real estate investor, that's like crazy. But it's fun to kind of look at it from that perspective too and say, well, well why aren't we doing that? Yeah. Right. To Jan is great. Totally. Yeah, totally. No, no, it did a fantastic write-up of him too. Um, we um and we're lucky to partner with uh, Thesis Driven uh, Leader Series podcast at, at at Turpentine, and so thought we'd have you uh talk talk with Noah. Noah, we ha we haven't even discussed uh real estate a ton, uh, or at least in the U.S. Uh, on this podcast. We talked a little bit about it in China and what, what's going on there, but maybe maybe we could start super high level. Um, Noah, you know when people think about how real estate intersects with the economy, sometimes people will think oh two thousand eight, but uh you know people haven't thought about it a, a ton since, or at least on a day to day level. Um, at least on the 102 frame, what, why don't you give sort of some high level thoughts around what, what's a good mental model to have in terms of how real estate uh, Im impacts the economy and what's happening in real estate impacting what, what, what's, uh, what, what's happening in the broader economy? Right. Well, well the reason that um, real estate crashed the economy in 2008 was because of, of finance. It was because of debt. You know, real estate is like a big thing, you know, the big building and you, you, it takes a long time to build and it takes a long time to make its money back because, you know, you have this flow of rent that comes in, um, or yeah, or just like the value of it takes a long time to materialize. And so, um, you have to, to, to borrow a lot of money to fund real estate and borrowing a lot of money is risky because then if it defaults, then poof, it goes away. And so people want to think that, you know, people want to reduce risk. And so, uh, in the lead up to 2008, what happened is that finance basically came up with a whole bunch of ways that it claimed reduced risk by essentially, uh, you know, bundling together real estate bonds, real estate debt from a whole bunch of different places and uh, demographic groups and all that stuff and claiming that their math said that this reduced risk a whole lot. Well, it didn't reduce risk a whole lot because it turns out that when, um, when the uh, economy got bad, it, it reduced risk, you know, day-to-day -day risk a lot during a good economy. But during a bad economy, it turns out that all the risks uh, then came back. And so then, um, then that's what sort of crashed the economy. And then all this debt kind of defaulted. And then when you have this big overhang of debt in the system, it prevents people from wanting to consume. It prevents companies from wanting to invest. And most of all, it prevents like banks from being able to make loans. And so then, you know, a lot of our industrial economy got screwed over because of that. And so... Um, yeah, so I think that's what that's the story of 2008. After 2008, uh, so so what's interesting is that um, including 2008 and before, real estate has always been the biggest component of our business cycle, right? So so real estate when real estate was was good, then the economy would be great. When real estate was, you know, and and the big fluctuations in what got built and what didn't was was real estate. You know, in the good times when economic activity expanded a lot, you know, manufacturing activity would expand somewhat, services would expand somewhat, but really uh, real estate would expand like a lot. And so that's, so, so housing is the business cycle was this, this famous paper that was written. Um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, since then it's, that has been less true since the big real estate bust, you know, so housing has been less of a part of the business cycle since 2008. 
Um, obviously, it was part of that cycle, right? It was a huge housing bust. But after that, housing took a long time to recover. And yet our economy sort of had this, this housingless recovery. It wasn't housingless, but we didn't, we didn't build that much housing in the, in the 2010s, but yet our economy recovered anyway. Uh, and so that was weird. And it was also bad because it, um, you know, because we didn't build enough housing. And so that's one reason that uh, we have this shortage of housing now, especially as people try to move from, you know, remote work makes people want to move, like makes demand for space, move from offices to, um, you know, homes where you want to have like a home office, a bigger place, whatever. And so, um, so that demand is increasing. And um, fortunately, it's kind of spread out throughout the United States more. So you're getting cities like Nashville or Austin booming instead of like just everything in San Francisco and New York, which is good. But at the same time, um, the, the long supply drought uh, is really coming back to bite us. And I think we're seeing a lot more rent inflation than we ought to. And I think that's what's going on in real estate now at the, the, the macro level. Well, just to tie it back to 2018, and I want to you know, point out, um, there's a great article by Kobe Lefkowitz um, in, on your Substack um, a little while ago talking about uh, some of the, what's going on right now in the housing market. Um, but one thing I really want to do is tie what's happening right now in the lending ecosystem back to 2008. So a lot of what happened after 2008 is regulators said, uh-oh, let's make sure that what happens in the housing market never has macro contagion. So real estate people can go and play their games, but it shouldn't infect the broader economy. And one of the ways they did that is putting a lot more regulatory scrutiny on lenders. So these certain requirements that lenders have to follow, they and a lot of it is not hard and fast rules, but regular reviews of their loan portfolios, for instance. And that was much stricter for the bigger banks than the, the, the smaller and regional banks. But one other thing, uh, just to put it in a macro context, we have way fewer banks than we used to. In 1985, we had 21,000 banks in the United States. Today, we have about 4,000 banks. So we have way more lenders. Those lenders are bigger. They do more things, and they're each under more regulatory scrutiny. So Kobe was writing about where have all the small developers gone? Well, it's much, much harder as a small developer to get a loan because they know, the banks know, that that's going to invite more regulatory scrutiny if they have a lot of these small loans with small developers who don't have a lot of track record, don't have a lot of collateral to put up. Right. So that's another thing just to tie it back to 2008 that's changed and is putting a headwind on housing construction. Right, just the, the lack of, of lending. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that's at the, the kind of micro level, like why housing was, was um, depressed in the 2010s, even though we had this economic recovery, but, but housing was no longer the, the big thing. Um, I think another, another thing that's important is that interest rates, housing is really vulnerable to interest rates because yes. if you have to borrow money, you have to borrow this money to, to build stuff and housing and also commercial real estate, of course, offices, factories, whatever, very vulnerable to interest rates because when you have to borrow all this money, you're really sensitive to the rate. Right. So you um, when when in corporate finance, you always talk about like your internal rate of return that you need or your hurdle rate. You talk about a hurdle rate, right, that you need to justify a project. Well, the only people I've ever talked about heard talk about hurdle rates in the real world are housing people and then maybe like, you know, mining like energy. Like basically hurdle rates um, are very important. If you have this this thing, we have to amortize the cost over this very long period. Uh, you borrow today and then you get your money back very slowly over a long period of time that's when hurdle rates really start to matter. So when the Fed raises interest rates like it has now, that can depress um, construction because, you know, quite apart from the, the consumer side thing that we always think about, we're like, oh, it's so expensive to get a mortgage. Well, yeah, it's expensive to get a mortgage. Think how expensive it is to actually borrow to build something, you know? And so, yeah. so I think that, that the Fed has been trying to cool off inflation by raising interest rates. And, um, and that has, I think, been another headwind for housing construction. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a saying in venture, which is when hors d'oeuvres are served, you eat. And one of the frustrations of what's going on right now is for the better part of the past decade, hors d'oeuvres were served. That is, rates were really low. Right. And for a lot of reasons, mostly zoning rules, we didn't eat. Construction right. was artificially constrained. We didn't build. We should have been building as a nation, millions of housing units that we weren't. 
for a lot of reasons, mostly regulatory. And now we're finally passing some changes. We're seeing the MB movement have some wins just in time to have the hors d'oeuvres taken away and rates go up. And that's a much tougher problem to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and, but also, I think it wasn't just zoning. I was obviously the finance thing we're talking about, like the fact that banks couldn't easily there's, lend to, to real estate during the 2010. There's a lot of reasons, but it's, you know, you take away one of those problems and, you know, real estate developers are creative people. They can come up with interesting solutions for the others. Um, but you add in blocker after blocker after blocker, regulatory lending, and it just right. gets really, really tough to overcome those, especially if you're a smaller developer. Right. So we're going to, you know, the, there's the big YIMBY push throughout America to, to essentially upzone everything, remove regulatory blocks to building. And that's obviously going to have to, per, you know, proceed state by state, even sometimes city by city, but especially state by state, because those are kind of the powers reserved to the states under a constitution. And really that's what states handle. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's spreading. I do think you see like, you know, Minnesota, Oregon, uh, California now. Um, some states, you know, removing more barriers to housing in New York isn't quite there yet, I guess. Um, and then, and then some states always had kind of low building, low barriers to housing like Texas because they kind of sprawl, uh, but not just sprawl, you know, they build a lot of apartments too. Um, but then, uh, there've been some great, um, you know, educational threads recently about why Houston manages to build so well. And it's not just sprawl. They also have this really cool, uh, policy where like basically neighborhoods get to decide how much density they want. And that allows them to build, you know, neighborhoods that want the density, get the apartment buildings and neighborhoods that don't want the density don't. And so that really, uh, that creates a lot of density. And so Houston is actually densifying, which is crazy to me. You know, I remember going to <laughs> drive in Houston with my, my family when we were, when I was a little kid and we'd get off in the middle of downtown and I was like, what happened to the city? Did it get bombed? Like it was all parking lots. It, the whole downtown was just parking lots. And you can see aerial photos of this now. You can see now Houston is this like thriving metropolis that's slowly densifying that has a increasingly nice downtown. It's just like probably the most underrated city in America, I would say right now, is Houston, Texas. It's like people remember the, the empty Houston of the 80s. It's like o empty oil town. But now it is a diverse, it's diversified industry. It's got like, you know, increasingly great food. Um, you know, it's uh, like, um yeah and and it's it's really great and and pretty cheap housing too and some some really increasingly nice walkable mixed use neighborhoods and pockets in Houston. And so so Houston's really underrated. Um yeah but 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 yeah so I, I, there's this Yimby movement throughout the uh, throughout the country and I think that we need to of course continue that and we can just say you know Yimby a lot over and over and we should do that. On top of that what do we do? Like what do we um besides removing you know zoning and, and associated restrictions like what do we also do to promote housing construction hey there eric here we're looking for sponsors to partner with us on our show if you or your business might be interested send us a note at eric at turpentine.co or through our website that's eric at turpentine.co if you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business you know that as you scale your systems break down and the cracks start to show if this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash 102. netsuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash 102. So, I mean, there are a lot that there's a lot that goes into promoting, like removing those zoning restrictions. So a lot of people are very focused on zoning narrowly. Uh, so say replacing single family zoning with, you know, allowing triplexes, duplexes, things like that. And that's great. And we should do that. But that alone isn't going to solve the problem. Remember, a lot of these restrictions have been built up 
across decades and exist in a lot of different forms. So it's not just that. It's setback rules. It is egress requirements. So one big push that's seeing a lot of success right now is this idea that you know a building that is five stories tall should not need multiple staircases. That That's not allowed in Europe. It, 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 Europe doesn't require that. You have better fire death outcomes in Europe. So you, you're seeing a lot of these pushes around these little tiny rules that are not really zoning necessarily. They're like, they're, they're building code, they're land use. Um, and that I think is, is going to gain momentum as well alongside these zoning reforms. It is complementary. You know, you need both. And I think in places like where you've seen just the legalization of, you know, duplexes, I think there was a city in Virginia that passed this, you know, but they didn't increase FAR, they didn't, that's floor area ratio, that's how much you can actually build. They didn't change their can setback rules. Brief, can you explain why floor area ratio is important briefly to our audience? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. So FAR stands for floor area ratio. It's one of the most important terms in real estate development. And basically what it means is it's the ratio of how many square feet you can build on a given plot of land. So if you have, a, it's a FAR of one and you have a 2,000 square foot lot, you can build 2,000 square feet on that lot. And you can do and that. And that could mean a two-story yeah. house that's 1,000 square feet on each floor. Exactly. So if you don't change that, but you allow more units, you're not necessarily gaining much. Like, and it often does not make sense to take a, an existing single-family house and spend the money to retrofit it to turn a... 1500 square foot house into two 1000 square foot duplex units like that's not a deal that's going to make uh make a whole lot of sense right um right okay so on the financing side is there anything we can do other than uh you know just inevitably cutting interest rates when inflation's final when people are finally satisfied inflation now well that's a that's a very big one um, there are going to be things we can do to cut construction material cost. Uh, that's going to be a that's a really big driver of you know the size of loan you need to take. Are you said the material construction cost, really material cost? Absolutely. Um, what are you know, the most expensive a lot of materials for construction? The most. Ex I mean, for instance, living here in New York City, they have requirements around using steel frame for all new construction. We don't allow wood frame in New York City. Um, and that's just like one example. Um, but there's a lot of markets and a lot of cities that have various restrictions in various ways about the materials oh, that you so it, can and cannot use. So allowing is, wood is allowing good. wood, for instance. But, you know, on the flip side, you need to sprinkle a wood frame. Oh, you need you need to sprinkle a wood frame construction. So, you know, you give and you take a little bit around. Um, you know, adding more fire rules. I mean, in New York, they make you sprinkler even single family steel frame construction. So it's, uh, it. there's a lot of little things that could be easier. On the plus side, no one dies in a fire anymore. That is true. Well, not necessarily, actually. Um, well, nobody dies in, in a fire have... in a new, in a new build multifamily in a new, building. In a new build, right, exactly. A lot of people die in pre-war single wood frame single family yeah. homes that have no fire safety systems that have antiquated electric and we probably make that worse by adding cost and making it hard to replace and rebuild those structures yeah. and weirdly end up with more fire deaths because people are in unrenovated oh, yeah. old single family homes which is where the vast majority of fire deaths occur in the United States today. Right, right. It's 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 in the sing, it's in the old wooden single family homes that people die Correct. in a fire. Right. People are not right. dying in fires in multifamily sprinkler buildings constructed in right. the last thirty exactly. years. That's not where it's happening. Yeah. Um. I will say that in in terms of uh, fire safety, um. Everybody like tourists now in Japan all go to this place called Golden Guy, which is a a, a few block uh, area of bars of tiny bars. Um, which uh, Golden Guy is really interesting because every few years it burns down. 
And then you rebuild all these tiny little cute bars that look incredibly like traditional and old. And they're just carefully rebuilt because it burns down every five years. And so they have no part of the charm of Golden Guys that they do not have fire sticks at all. Um, but so, you know, there's, there's other things in life besides fire safety, but yes, anyway, um, let's talk about the types of things that are getting built. So everybody now talks about, uh, uh, five over ones, which are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're named that because five is a code for wood and one is a code for, I think, concrete. Yeah. It's pe and people, it's, it's people think it's because it's five, it's five stories over one story, but it's actually type right. five construction, which is stick right. frame over type one, which right. is steel Because they're mostly and, three to four uh, stories over one story, right? Yeah. I mean, some uh, go up to six stories in total, actually like five stories over Got one, it. but a, a that's true. not why they're named that way. Right. Uh, so it's, it's steel and concrete are the one? Yes, that's type one construction. Got it, got it, got it. All right, so um, so these are becoming very popular. And uh, in terms of why everybody's building these, number one, it's because you get to build not all of it, obviously not the first story, but you get to build a lot of it with wood, and wood's cheap. Is that right? That's that, That's correct. I mean, wood frame is the cheapest kind of construction you have and you know it's even cheaper right. than a lot of modular out there got it. and why, why is why is the first floor steel and concrete why, um, why so do they the, do that the primarily for 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 code reasons is you can only have so many floors of of stick built um so they make the first floor some kind in some cases the first two floors um it's not stick always just wood, the first right? floor. You could have when the first... When you say stick, you mean wood, what was wood construction. You mean wood. Stick is... is yes, wood, when I say stick... Is a slang term for wood. You mean you can only have yes, so many floors right. made I, of wood. I, I will throw some real estate jargon out at you. <laughs> yes. When I say stick, I mean type up. five or wood frame construction. I, I read Brian Potter, so I'm prepared. <laughs> so... All right. It's my favorite substack. Brian's anyway, great. Brian is awesome. Um, all right, so... so um, Five over ones are shortish, and but but they're also it's a um they they tend to fill up the space like they they really um when you have a place with high floor to area ratio you're allowed to build a lot of floor space but you don't um it, it's cheaper to fill up the whole space and build with cheap cheapo wood than to build something very tall like you know your your old style like tower in the park kind of thing you build it like China builds you build something very tall but it's more expensive because you can't build something that tall with wood also known as a stick and you can't build that something that tall with with wood and so you um you uh um instead you you get all that floor area just by by filling the whole uh, lot right you get a big boxy thing that goes right to the edges of your lot that that's right? correct and that's why you end up with big boxes i would say that's starting to change in terms of wood with ma mass timber construction you're starting to see some mass timber buildings go above 10 stories um vancouver Can you actually what just um, what mass timber is yeah so mass timber is and and i i don't know the technical aspects of it and of well enough to dive in there but it's basically a way of kind of treating and effectively processing wood to give it greater strength and super strong wood mass timber construction has a lot of benefits uh, you know, just from a construction, just from a durability standpoint, from a fire safety standpoint over traditional wood, just, you know, using two by fours. Um, hmm. You just saw Vancouver, for instance, uh, recently pass uh, a law that went from banning mass timber to encouraging mass timber. Uh, which kind of goes huh. to a point I often make about the real estate world that we are moving to a world where everything is either prohibited or mandatory uh, and wood and, and <laughs> mass timber clearly goes in that category of like Every well in a lot of places it's banned but in some places yeah. it's strongly encouraged and they'll subsidize it you know that uh that th that's an old richard Feynman quote right about physics yes yes yeah. okay but I'm, it I'm glad applies that perfectly we well to real estate some nerdy some nerdy uh, references here. All right, so um, people complain about the architecture of five over ones. And my instinct is that most of these people just don't actually want to see apart new apartment buildings or just instinctively kick against anything new because since the 1970s, America has had a massive 
defense in depth against any new thing ever being built by anyone anywhere. And people are just used to stasis and therefore anything that's not stasis seems like the scary unknown, like, you know, like growing up or death or, or, you know, like aliens. But so that's my theory as to why people say five over ones are ugly. But is there any actual thing we can do to make these, these five over ones that we're building everywhere that we're trying to build everywhere look better to your average person so that they don't, you don't get quite as much support for like the, ew, it's ugly factor. People have always thought new construction is ugly. I mean, I, 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 I'd encourage listeners hmm. to look at some of the opinions that came out about New York City brownstones when they were built in the late 19th century. They were pilloried. People said this is huh. greedy developers making cookie cutter homes. Um, huh. You know, they all look the same. They're boxy. They use cheap materials. It was all the same stuff that people use today and say today about five over ones about a type of construction that we now cherish. And these are landmarked blocks today in, in Brooklyn Heights and Cobble Hill of in the West Village of beautiful New York City brownstones. But when they were first built, yeah, what developers would do is they would take a street and they would go down the street and they would build the same house 20 times. And people hated it. Right. And you look and at now, some of those and you Oh, sorry, there, there's massive lag. It. So if I cut you off, it's because there's a there's a several second lag between our between us. Yeah, I'm getting that too. Um and now they love the brownstones and they can't stand, they say all those same things about the five over ones. And so <laughs> do I, the yeah. one thing that I think would be better is no design, like the, the whole design by committee of the design review where this thing of you are an architect and you submit your plans and your rendering to some committee and they come back and they say it needs more variation of materials and facade articulation. And so you get these weird buildings that have like blotchy different materials and look weird. That is not because the architect wanted to do that. That's not because the developer wanted to do that. That is because they went to design review and design review came back and said, you need more facade articulation you need more material variation and therefore you get this weird patchwork look so i think we will look back on this hmm. style of vernacular architecture as being heavily influenced by design by committee and i think that's huh. that's something we'll regret how, how do we a vernacular architecture means like housing for normal people yeah it just means like what nor like non architects were building in that period of time, in that place. A star architect is like an architect for like fancy, like convention centers and skyscrapers, right? Yeah, exactly. Stadiums. Like, uh, you know, Calatrava or a Vignoli or someone like that. Like, you know, that they're not building vernacular architecture. Vernacular architecture yeah. is what happens when you go like hire your architect down the street and like a general contractor to, uh, you right. know, build whatever comes out in the first set of drawings. I, I would definitely take you know, um, second year Japanese architecture student over Star Architect where I designing a city, but that's just me. Um, because they actually build physical models with their hands still. They're the only, I think, architecture schools where they still teach you to do that. But um, I could be wrong, but I read that. Anyway, um, all right. So, so um, people always complain about new stuff. Uh, designed by, by committee is, is not great. Um, Eric, Jump in here and start asking some questions here because, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a lot of my questions. Yes. You haven't said much, so what are you wondering? Totally. Totally. So well, when we were talking earlier about how real estate affects the, the economy, but, of course, uh, the, the, um, the economy, uh, the macro situation deeply affects real estate. And so, Brad, do we see real estate developers having to become experts at how the Fed works uh, or, or sort of, uh, you know, have to make these macro predictions when, when thinking about the, the sort of, you know, risk uh, reward or sort of the economic calculus of their projects or how, how does that work out? Absolutely. I mean, you know, real estate developers like have to have a view on the future state of interest rates, the macro picture, et cetera, because 
if I'm a real estate developer, I have to model an exit in year three, year four, and that exit is going to be driven by how much is someone willing to pay for this cash flow stream that I'm generating from my project. So I'm going to model something called an exit cap rate, which is just basically a ratio of what someone's willing to pay to the cash flow I'm generating. And my returns vary wildly based on what that exit cap rate is. So a lot of developers will juice their projected returns by decreasing their cap rate in year five. And nobody actually knows what the cap rate is going to be out there. So, you know, you have a debate about it. But, you know, none of these people, other than, you know, probably some of the folks at Blackstone, are really qualified to be making these predictions. I mean, these are not bond traders here. So, yeah, absolutely. You end up with these, um, you know, uh, developers having to make bets. Interestingly, in Europe, it works quite differently. So, in many places in Europe, for instance, you're not going to have a developer take that degree of risk. They are going to sign a forward purchase agreement with a large LP, usually a pension fund, an insurance company, something like that, to purchase the building for a given price in a certain number of years as long as it, it actually gets delivered and actually gets filled. So the developer is taking construction risk and they're taking market risk, but they're not taking macro risk. They're not taking interest rate risk. And that seems kind of hmm. like a better way to do it, in my view. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And and so earlier in the conversation, you mentioned how we were, you know, in this era where the hors d'oeuvres were were uh, were around. I.e., we had low interest rates. Um, is your mental model of the world that we will be one day returning back to another era like the 2010s? where the the sort of going is 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 good or or is that a mirage that we can't uh ex we won't sort of see that that uh you know another extended period of time like that eric that is above my pay grade if i were <laughs> if, if, if if i had a view on where interest rates are going i would be trading bonds right now uh instead I have a Substack and a podcast. So <laughs> look, do I think there's going to be a, what I don't believe there will be is a very long multi-decade period of interest rate declines. We just, they're not high enough right now to have that kind of massive secular period of decline that created so much wealth for people in real estate. You know, if you think where interest rates were in the 1980s, and you saw them kind of slowly, steadily, like not perfectly decline over a period of 40 years. And that just created tremendous wealth. Um, some people would say an asset bubble, but regardless, created a, a lot of wealth and we're just nowhere near that starting point. I just don't see us getting, that is not going to happen. Will we get back to, you know, 2018 rates? Maybe. Uh, but we're not going to see that period of secular decline in wealth creation the way we did over the past 40 years. N N Noah, what, what's your view on this topic? Um, well, okay, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think about this, and I haven't really formed a view. Um, so, so one thing I think we need to do is public housing construction. When I say that, people hear the public housing, and they think that what I mean is social housing owned and operated by the government, which we had in the mid-20th century which a lot of people didn't like because every locality uh, pretty much across America, almost every locality co-opted it into a way to get poor black people away from wherever they lived by concentrating them in these housing projects like Cabrini Green in Chicago. Very notorious, very famous. And that's why you hear people in old rap songs talk about the projects. In fact, you may hear, still hear people talk about the projects. But now it's probably more of a you know sort of notional uh, callback to those times because we demolished most of the projects and replaced them with Section 8 housing vouchers, um, which just ignored the housing construction problem because we were just subsidizing demand. We were just paying people, giving people money to go out and buy housing somewhere, uh, which in, in practice meant the far-flung suburbs. And, um, and not, you know, that didn't really solve the construction problem. It just increased demand. So um, remember that if you subsidize demand without increasing supply, you're asking for price increases. 
right? So there's that there's that famous meme of I just need to subsidize demand. I just need to subsidize demand. Well, no, no, you need to increase supply. But like, okay, so now, but but public housing construction is a little different. So the the federal government owns a ton of land, and state governments own some land, and. Um, often this land is in national parks, but often it's actually right in the middle of cities. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I think Treasure Island had a lot of that uh, in San Francisco. But I, I'm not, don't quote me on that. But right. I think they did. And so it did. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was right. <laughs> um, so basically you can have the government come in and say, all right, we're building something right here and we're going to build it. And then you can NEPA it all you want, but like, you know, the government owns the land and the government can like um, speed things through the, the courts and whatever uh, with the mighty power of a, the administrative state and whatnot. And then you can build things and then you just decide to build them. You know, you just have the government decide to build things. And what there are a number of cool things about this. Number one, you can do it counter cyclically. So if you have a recession, you know, the, if, if housing is the business cycle and then you have a recession, and people stop building stuff. Well, that's when the government can come in and just start building stuff. Goodbye recession, right? Everybody has a job now building stuff. And like, you, so then you can do this counter cyclical housing construction, which in turn creates predictability in the housing markets because you know that construction won't have these booms and busts. And we don't have booms and busts. It's less, um, less risky to, you know, invest anything that depends on real estate construction, like a construction company or, or you know, materials or whatever, right? Because you're going to have steady demand instead of boom and bust demand which then the steady flow of demand. So that's, that's why China builds, well, they do a lot of dumb stuff in an attempt to do this, but actually public housing construction, smart stuff, and Singapore does this well. Um, so that's one thing you get is uh, this counter cyclical uh, stuff. You also just get a lot more housing construction um, because now you have some of this land where people weren't building housing and now you do. Um, and you can, then the thing is that you can sell this off. So, so in social housing is the model where the government owns and operates the, you know, apartments, and then the government's your landlord, and there's all kinds of problem, inherent problems with that. Instead, build the houses, have the government build the houses, or the government more, more um, uh, specifically contracts to build the houses. The government decides where the houses will be built and hires developers to make them, uh, and then the developers come and make the houses, and then the government sells them off to people. And the cool thing about this is you can use it also for... Um, Wealth distribution. It's really easy to do wealth distribution via housing. So what you do is you, um, when you're selling these, so so you make basically condos, right? And you sell off uh, condos or, or single family homes. You can do, but condos are especially good because then the government will continue to own the land underneath the condo, and basically you just own the, the condo itself. And so uh, you still have property. You still own stuff, but then the government it makes it easier for the government to sort of eminent domain and redevelop stuff. Like if it wants to turn a building into a higher building some, someday. So, so you, you, um, you have a condo and then the government sells it off. But if you're a first time home buyer, like, you know, or you're, uh, or, or, you know, you're poor, then the government will give you a big discount. So the government will take a home that on the market would go for, let's say, $600,000, right? For some condo in, in a nice city, right? And then, um, and then the government will sell that to you for $250,000. Well, the day after you do that sale, you get $350,000 of free wealth that just pops right into your account. Yay, you. And then you can have some lockup where you have to live in it for a certain amount of time before you sell it. You can't just like flip it overnight, blah, blah, blah. But then, um, but, uh, you know, you can say that if you don't, if you want to move out before a certain date, you have to like sell it for this big discount to another first time. It's easy to get around that, you know, kind of gaming. But basically, um, you let people have uh, a wealth via the housing system. And the thing is that instead of redistributing wealth, you're creating new wealth. You're not, it's not like, this isn't like taxing the rich and giving to the poor. This is like creating a new thing and giving it to the poor, right? You're increasing the total amount of real wealth in the world increases when a new house is built right? Ultimately, the value of real wealth is tied to real assets. It's tied to some physical thing that people value in the world, right? Not just numbers on a spreadsheet, not just numbers on paper. And so true wealth is, um, is tied to, to real assets. And so you're creating a real asset by building this new house. And by allocating that new wealth to poor people, you flatten out the wealth distribution and you create economic equality without redistribution. Uh, except for the 
small amount of redistribution you needed to, you know, you know, the taxes to like put the administrative stuff, state stuff. So there's like a tiny bit. Mostly this is not wealth redistribution. This is uh, wealth creation allocated to poor people. It's a non-zero sum, positive sum game. So I'm pretty bullish on that. Oh, Noah, I, I, you know, that is, it's very similar to the Singapore model, correct? And kind yes. of how Singapore, you know, the government builds and then conduit out. Um, I wish I had your optimism around state capacity and the government's capability of building things. I mean, I, I live in New York City and, you know, one of our initiatives right now is to increase sidewalk width because we have a lot of pedestrians and we're trying to reduce the number of cars. But actually right. building a curb is too costly and is too intense of a construction project for a city as poor and backwards as New York City. So instead of building curbs, we do paint and flex posts. And nobody actually recognizes these as sidewalks, but like drivers don't use them either. So you get these weird islands next to right. sidewalks. I'm so familiar, yes. I think there needs to be a big state capacity development if we have any hope of doing something like this and having the government directly addressing this housing crisis. I do like, though, the counter cyclicality of having the government directly involved in some way. I think that is a that is a big benefit there. Absolutely. But, you know, on the state capacity issue, I think people don't you know, once you start thinking carefully about how to build state capacity, you realize that there's no like state capacity factory out there. You can't build it. You can't pre-build state capacity and then sort of install it. You must create it as you go. And so giving the government tasks to do is not a thing you do after you build state capacity. It's a thing you do at the same time as building state capacity. Because, you know, it's like, um, it's like working out, right? It's not like, um, you know, it's like, they're, they're, well, I guess it's not like working out because, you know, working out would be like you go to the gym, you get really swole, you get really strong, and then you, um, and then you go lift some heavy things. But you can't do that with the with state capacity. You can't have the there's no there's no gym for the government, right? The gym for the government is the real world. So the way you create state capacity is you task the government doing things. Then you, uh, and, oh, by the way, there is one exception, which is war. So a lot of governments after World War II really knew how to do a lot of stuff because war had forced them to on the fly build up their capacity to like move around ammunition and guns and ships and people and whatever, right? But tanks. But but then but and then after the war they could apply that capacity to building highways and building, you know, apartments. But if we're going to do that outside of a major war, we're going to need to actually do the thing while we develop the ability to do the thing. And so so I'm pessimistic about where our state capacity is now. I know it's low, right? I know it's low. Um, but that, but if you say, okay, we're not going to build, we're not going to try to build anything uh, with the government because the government's not good at building things, you're going to continue to have a government that's not good at building things. So don't. So say government, go build things. And then the government goes and says, I can't because there's all these contractor requirements and need to stop me and we don't have the staff and nobody knows how to do it and please give me more money. And you're like, okay, get this done. Er. And then you, you know, you like, you, you, you breathe down their necks and you, you right. force them to get things done. You do give them money, but you like demand accountability. And then like 10 years later, like, okay, we know how to build this stuff. You know, now we figured it out. And so I think that's how you do it. And if you look at like South Korean industrial policy, which was outside of major war, if you look at a lot of things, if you, um, you, you see these successes, you actually see these, these governments building out state capacity in real time as they give a task to do. And sometimes they fail and they fail and they fail. And then after like five, seven, 10 years, they succeed, they start to succeed. They figure out how to do it. So they, here's my, this is my rant of the week. This is like, Eric, we should have rant of the week actually be like a, like an official thing where, where, yes. you know, I start to rant and you're like, Noah, this is rant of the week. Be aware, you know, um, but like, exactly. That'll be the yeah. call. <laughs> right. Li that's what libertarians yeah. don't understand. They think there's some sort of gym out there where we, you know, where the government can teach itself to be efficient before we sick it on anything or there's hardcore libertarians who just think government will never be efficient so all we have to do is you know all we can hope to do is deregulate and i'm like no 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 look at countries that actually build they have effective governments and the governments 
don't do all of the building or even most of the building, but they do some of the building. And so let's get that, you know, and we have to just learn as we do, you know. So, so let's focus on like in New York, we're building a Second Avenue subway. Right. And oh, my gosh, we've been building the Second Avenue subway for 75 years. <laughs> and so I think we, you know, there is this I, I just think if you went to if the city came out and said, hey, we are going to build half a million units of new housing, I would support that in a second. But there's it would uh, my concern is it would become this everything burger liberalism, uh, which I think is a wonderful term of, you know, you have all these various requirements that are layered on top of it. And I think you have to. I look at that in the projects we have today that are driving costs, that are driving it to slow down, that are driving those overages. And like, how do we tackle that in the projects we're really building today? And so if we allocate $50 billion to building housing, we actually get a million units of housing out of that and not 50,000 units of housing. Right. And so, exactly. But I, I do like that, you, uh, that you've turned everything bagel liberalism into a burger, and I think that that should be our new thing. We, <laughs> we're tired of bagel discourse. We want burgers. Um, that yeah. means that all the people... We've got to appeal like, to real Americans. No. That's right. <laughs> real not Americans don't eat bagels. They eat hamburgers. Elites. Yeah, not just these coastal elites. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Real Japanese people eat bagels. But, then, <laughs> but, but real Americans don't. Um, so then, um but, but, yeah so okay so so i think that with so with the chips act it's interesting because what we're seeing is people um we're seeing people uh um figure out what the blockages are to building semiconductor fabs fabs in america um and and also with solar power we're finding that and with battery factories we're finding that um actually Battery factories are turning out pretty well. It turns out that that almost everyone is actually like will will accept battery factories in, in somewhere near that. But but chip fabs are more of a problem. Um anyway, so then uh we're figuring it out. And I think the the everything burger is the um is the contracting requirements. So you have to have this percent of union labor even in a state that doesn't have any union workers like Arizona, right? You have to have this um this amount of community input and blah blah. Usually it's it's really not that many things. It's usually just community input and union percentages. It's like when you look at what these contracting requirements are, it's not like 20 different things. It's like three, two to three different things. But it's usually things that are kind of hard to get. Well, the community input's just terrible. Like yeah. throw that over the, over the, under the bus, over the boat. Wherever. Yeah, I mean, the, the community it. input is like, oh, there's only two things, but one of, the, one of them is community one input. Of, it's like, one of them is a well, thousand how, things how else, you know, how was, but how was the show, Miss Lincoln? <laughs> exactly right. that's exactly right. um no you're 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 not wrong i mean that's absolutely true and um okay but uh it what when it's not that hard to get rid of that by just saying okay no more community input then then you get rid of all the community at once you know what i mean um that's easier said than done politically right because people want to um you know, people love their community input. So we, that's a thing we have to struggle with. But in terms of percentage union labor, you can easily just scale that to how much union labor is in the state. Like if you have a state where 5% of the relevant workforce is unionized and you have a, you know, 25% union labor requirement, you are fucked. And so you can obviously scale that to local conditions because there's such a thing as right to work states where you don't have a lot of union. So blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can do stuff like that. It, that's not too hard. I honestly think it's when we talk about the everything burger, uh, it is just community input. It's it, there, there's also the minority owned business things. Like you'll say, like go find me a minority owned business in you know Colorado. Okay, so go find me a minority person in color. Like you can't, like you know maybe, but like it's really really hard, right? To it's for, it's for a those thousand things. cuts. You can scale that. You can scale that to who whatever. Yeah, well, it's a thousand cuts, but we have a thousand band aids, and so. Um, just saying like, ah, government, fuck that shit. That hasn't worked for us. We've been doing that since the eighties and it has resulted in us not being able to build anything because when, you know, when you don't have a capable government that capable of building things, you get things like the nonprofit industrial complex. You get things like they're over, you know, excessive regulatory state. Those things are a substitute for 
a strong, competent government. You have less of those things in Japan because you have less of those things in countries with a strong, capable bureaucracy because the government can address your concerns. If you have environmental concerns in Japan, you say, help civil servants. We have environmental concerns and the civil servants will go, okay, done. And then, you know, here in America, you're like, help, I have environmental concerns. Well, who is there? Just the courts. You have to sue. Then you have to form a civic group. You have to do it, you know, bottom up volunteer rebellion of low information NIMBYs every time infiltrated by a whole bunch of assholes. Like, you know, in Japan, the civil servants like, well, this protects the environment. I checked. And then you're like, yes, you checked. And so then they did check. And so this idea that we can just like dispense with government and just be a bunch of like, you know, 1980s libertarians, it did not work. It worked, you know, obviously we need some sort of libertarianism. We need a lot of deregulation, right? We need to remove a lot of regulatory barriers. That's important to building stuff, but it's not going to get you all the way there. And in, if we think that that is, that that's the only thing we need to do, and that we don't need to build state capacity at all, and that, you know, we should just throw our hands up and say, you know, drown the government in a bathtub, which by the way, never happened. It's not, it's going to backfire because it's a lot easier for people to create in, in, in lieu of a strong state, people will create a regulatory state, a kludgy state. And so I think that we just have to be realistic about the fact that like, you know, and, and that's not even a function of democracy because like, you know, in, in, um, in autocracies without a strong, like centralized state, you know, you, you, you still have trouble getting things done. And so, um, Anyway, I, I just think we need to accept that state capacity is hard, but it is worth doing. And that the idea yeah. of just like wave our hands and, and give up at anything that the government does is, is a, something that has been sort of tried and failed. And now let's try something else. That, that, what do you think? Unless Brad has, has a response to that, I, I want to segue into maybe a last topic of the day that, that relates to this, which is uh, new cities. Um, and, 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 um, I'm, you know, Brad, you've, you've written about, you had an episode about why you're excited about it. Noah, you also had a post on the California forever project. I'm curious where we're excited about new cities or in what instantiations and how, how do we think about the feasibility of them, given some of the problems we've been talking about in, in, in this episode, Brad, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, I think what Jan Schramack and California forever are doing, I think it's great. I think we need this kind of particularly private sector investment in new places that can frankly develop new models of what building a place looks like. I mean, we have been building new places in the United States, but they've been really sprawly. They've been very car focused and it's sort of been a kind of a Ponzi scheme of infrastructure of, you know, cities will get money to build these new places, but the, you know, the tax revenue from these very sprawly developments doesn't actually really cover the maintenance of water, sewer, roads, electric, etc. What Shramik is proposing is a dense, say, three to six story on average urban core that is relatively car light. So you don't need a car to get around that urban core. It is connected by rail to Sacramento and, and San Francisco um, and has a real mix of uses. It's not just another single family housing development, but there's a mix of industrial, office, residential, and a lot of open park space. So he, California Forever bought about 62,000 acres, and the majority of that is going to be maintained as open space. So I think he's doing a lot of things right. Um, I think one interesting way that, you know, initially a barrier, but I think in the long run is going to be a, a plus is he's got to win this referendum, this ballot referendum in Solano County. Based on the way their rules work, he has to get approval of a majority of voters in November, a presidential election year, mind you, um, which is a good thing for him. I think higher turnout, I think, works to his benefit. Um to say yes to this development. And if they say yes, a popular vote actually supersedes CEQA and the environmental regulation, things like that. You know, if the, the CEQA is just about if a politician decides to approve something, if the voters say it goes, it goes. So this is all going to come down to this November ballot initiative 
Um, and I think they've structured that really well. That is, the more jobs they create for Solano County residents, the bigger and denser they can build their city. Um, so they've kind of baked in their own incentives. They also just got a letter of support from Travis Air Force Base, which is the military base bordering their new city. And there was a lot of concern. Travis Air Force Base is a big employer. There was a lot of concern that they're going to they're gonna scare off the Air Force Base by ringing it with development. Um, they built in a buffer area and they got the base's support because the base needs housing. So I think they're going about it in in a really smart way. And I was I was struck by uh you know Shramek's thoughtfulness when we had him on our show last week. He's one of the sharpest people that I know. He's just really on the ball. Um it's hard to find something he hasn't thought of yet. He's been doing it for a while. I mean, he really he started working on this, I believe, in twenty fifteen. So he's been at this already for nine years thinking about new cities looking at sites understanding what's worked what hasn't um you know one thing i i i I like to remind you know the more tech uh people who think about new cities is that we have been building new cities in the united states even beyond uh the sprawly stuff north of dallas but one of my favorite projects is Kyrgios Joel, which is a new city north of New York. Uh, It went from zero to about 30,000 residents in the past 25 or so years. Um, It is a uh, basically a new build community of Hasidic Jews originally from South Williamsburg, well, originally from Hungary, but via South Williamsburg, got priced out of South Williamsburg started buying land in Orange County, New York, um, about 60-ish miles north of New York City in the Hudson Valley. Uh, played some How's real politics. Sorry? With Sorry to interrupt. How's that Kyr- spelled? Kyrgios Joel. So it's How's K-I-R-Y-A-S. Joel. J-O-E-L. Kyrgios? J-O-E-L. All right. I'm going to yes, just Google is, that um, while you talk here. It sets a lot of... Uh, watermarks good and bad for the united states it is the poorest zip code in the united states the poorest zip code in the u.s not in west virginia not in rural mississippi it is curious joel new york wait are these Um, hasidic jews yeah they're hasidic jews oh they also have the youngest zip code in the united states uh, the birth rates are something I forget exactly what they are, but they're above six kids per wim- per, per woman. Huge wow. families. Um, that's like Niger. That's obviously, like do better, the math there. It's Niger. growing tremendously fast. Oh. They okay. um they played some real politic with the local school board about ten fifteen years ago, and got the state of New York to give them their own town. It's the wow. first new town created in New York in a very long time. So now they have the town of Palm Tree. And what that allowed them to do is control their own zoning. So now they have total control of their own zoning. And now well if you drive down Route 17 in New York State and you look off to one side, you will see all these like little six, seven-story towers popping up off the side. Hmm. And that is uh, the town of Palm Tree, known as Kyrgios Joel. Uh, so it, we are building new cities. They're just all kind of weird. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, yeah, I, I like that. I When I think of new cities, I always think of like the new cities built in like the 70s, like Irvine, which all turned out super suburban. I just haven't. Right. Uh, I, I've, I've got to go, Eric, right here in a second. But um, what, yeah, um, what, uh, Brad, what are the, um, like, what's the densest new city, the densest interesting new construction or city or neighborhood uh, that in America recently? Well, certainly Kyrgios Joel and a lot of what's happening. And there's a number of okay. these little communities uh, in the Hudson Valley uh, that are incredibly dense. Um, so, like, the densest city 
in New York, in the state of New York, is not New York City. It is some small uh, Hasidic town. Um, not Kira Shoal, it's actually a different one north of the city. So there's a lot of dense new city development happening. Um, a lot of people, I, I would say people less, uh, if you want to read more about that, there is um, a wonderful book called The American Shtetl uh, that huh. came out two years ago about Kiryas Joel and the for foundation of Kiryas Joel um, and how it became super Trumpy too, which is kind of funny. Um, I'm ideologically anti-shtetl, but, but this is interesting uh, examples. So the other example I'd give is uh, a lot of these new urbanist towns, um, you know, and, and, and they draw uh, praise and criticism. But um, we did a feature in the newsletter uh, last year on Casey Roloff, who built a town on the Washington coast called Seabrook, um, which mm. now has about 2000 homes or so. He built it over 20 years, didn't take any outside capital in any meaningful way. Um, and it's a really cool, nice town. And it's become kind of one of the top vacation destinations for people in the Seattle area. And oh, one of the coolest examples of, you know, new urbanism built over the past uh, 20 odd years. Um, and he's oh, now out trying to raise money and, 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 and go do this in a bigger way. Um, but one thing I think Shramek is doing well is taking a lot of these kind of new urbanist concepts and designs and, you know, and he wouldn't call it new urbanism. He, kind of avoids that but i would call it new urbanism um and actually making it not a vacation destination but actually trying to recruit industrial use office use job growth which which you haven't really seen in many of the biggest new urbanist projects to date got it well eric i have to go um let's uh let, let, let's wrap we're, on we're that. Brad, thank you so much for, for joining uh, us at Econ 102 and uh, stoked to have you in the network. We'll have to do another episode uh, another time in the future. I love it. Thanks so much for having me on. Econ 102 is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen, In the Arena, The Cognitive Revolution, and more. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave us the review in the App Store. You can keep up with both of our Substacks for written analysis of the topics we cover in the show at noaopinion.substack.com and erictornberg.substack.com. Thanks for listening.